goodness, I just sense the Holy Spirit here. <clears throat> we just do our part today and just yield to you, Holy Ghost. Hmm. Hallelujah. All of those of you, those of you who've just feeling holiday blues, I want you to just stand up right now. Those of you who've been feeling like you're in a funk, like this has just been, the holidays are not enjoyable for you, I want you to just go ahead and stand up. This is just a drill we're going to do. I, I, those of you who've experienced, yeah, there's one. Is anybody else bold enough to just stand? Why don't you just stand with me then, because I, I tend to get into a little bit of a funk at the, at the holiday. There's another brave soul. Anybody else? There's, there's three, four, five. There we go. I just feel like the Holy Spirit wants to do something for those of you who would receive it, those of you who would just choose to be chosen. I want you to just lift your hands right now. Father, would you just give them a double dose of joy right now in the Holy Ghost? Breathe all over them, Holy Ghost. I want you to just take a deep breath, both all of you, all of you who are standing. Those of you who wish you would have stood, I want you to just take a deep breath. And just say, I receive the joy of the Lord right now. Yeah. It's not fake. It's real. And if you'll receive it and choose to be chosen, he'll pour it out on you. He said, all of you who will hunger and thirst for righteousness and more of me, I will give it to you. So if you choose to be chosen, stand boldly and say, I receive the joy of the Lord. And I will make the joy of the Lord. It will become my strength. You don't have to fake it until you make it this holiday season. You don't have to put on a face. And when people ask you, man, why are you so full of joy? You can say, because the Holy Spirit lives in me. Father, give them a supernatural dose of the Holy Spirit. Let this act of faith that they have just shown you receive it now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you. You may be seated. Uh, glory to God. I believe that the prophetic is a very big part of the New Testament church. And um, the gifts of the Holy Spirit should be active in the, Holy, in the, in the New Testament church. I, I'm, I don't want to do church as, as usual. I don't want to just go and sing three songs, sit down, hear a dry old message, and then get up and go and eat and beat, beat the Baptist to wayside. I want the Holy Spirit to have his way, or, or I don't have anything to say. And, and neither do you. We, we have to rely on, an, on the Holy Spirit. We have to. We have to rely on the Holy Spirit. And um, I said it earlier uh, last week, you know, we are in a very emotionally charged season. And, and I said this out loud, if we are going to survive in this angry generation where emotions are leading the nation and even the world. How many of you noticed that? Emotions are not leaders, they're locators. Let me say that again. Emotions are not leaders, they are locators. And right now we're seeing a lot of, oh my gosh, emotion that's leading the charge right now. And that's not how we're supposed to be. We're supposed to be led by the Holy Spirit. Isn't that what Romans 8, 14 says? Those who are led by the Spirit of grace shall be my children. Don't be acting a fool out there burning the joint down. Oh, I'm a Christian. I go to Victory Christian Center. Shut up. <laughs> As my Italian brothers just taught me back in the room, stut the zit means shut your mouth. Don't let your emotions lead you. Let the Holy Spirit lead you. And we've been talking about uh, how we, we, we spent the last couple months just talking about faith and how faith is a very uh, integral part of our Christian walk. But faith without love doesn't even work. And the Holy Spirit has just challenged me uh, just over the last few weeks. Teach them about love. Don't forget about the love walk. Don't forget that they can have all of the talent in the world. They can have all of the generosity. They can have all of the loyalty. But if they're not walking in a supernatural revelation of the glory and the love of God, it's just a clanging cymbal or a crashing gong. And it makes no difference. And so last week we began this journey in loving our way to victory, beginning with this, this thought. you got to be quick to forgive, right? Quick to forgive. The offense, the event, the, the offense is an event. 
But choosing to stay in, walking in a fence and living in that sewer is a choice. And for you to choose to stay there really contaminates anything that comes through you. And it really makes a mess of things when emotions uh, get involved. Emotions are not an evil thing. They're locators. And when you see this thing called anger, you know, rise up on the inside of you, let it locate you. Let the Holy Spirit recognize it, shine a flashlight on it, and say, temper that with love. And so we, we talked about how Jesus was teaching his disciples, look, it's, it's easy to love the lovable. It's not so easy to love the unlovable. Uh, my pastor used to say it like this. He'd say, it's, it's, uh, you can reason with reasonable people. You ever try to reason with an unreasonable person? I just feel like you just go around and around and around, right? You can love the lovable, but it's more difficult to love the unlovable. And Jesus comes right out and says, you've been taught to hate your enemy, but I tell you to love your enemy. You know who an enemy is described at or it's defined at? Is anyone who is against you. You could say it in this day and age, anyone who has a differing opinion, that's my enemy. Oh, you see it all the time. Somebody throws something up on Facebook, right? And immediately you get blocked. Why do they block me? Because their emotions are leading. There are people that I have chosen specifically that have come right out against me and said, you're a heretic, you loon ball, all kinds of crazy stuff about me. And I choose to leave them on, I choose to leave them on the nice list. And I let them stay on. Let, let them say what they want to say. I just ignore it and go on. Isn't that what we, we learned last week? We're supposed to just be quick to forgive and not even recognize it. I want to say it again. We are not going to survive this angry generation without a supernatural. That means an above the average natural revelation of the love of God. This is what triggered the disciples to say when Jesus said, look, how many times has your brother offended? Peter said, Lord, how many times should I forgive? And, and Jesus said, look, don't just forgive him seven times. Because Peter said, do I, should I just forgive him seven times, right? Just according to the law. And Jesus said, no, 70 times seven. At which point this triggered the emotions of the disciples. And they said, Lord, increase our faith. I don't think we can do this. Lord, increase our faith. To which Jesus responded, you don't need faith for that. What? Oh, yeah. We're going to look at that today. Today, I want to dig a little bit deeper into the soil of your heart. And, and like I said last week, this is not an easy message to preach because every time I preach a message like this, I get opportunities to walk it out. But I feel like the Holy Spirit has just been uh, just impressing my heart so, so rawly lately, so raw. He just keeps ra rubbing this part of my heart saying, look, you got to preach this. I know you want to preach a message to charge people up and you want to run on chairs, but maybe you'll run out of here after I preach this, but that's okay. You've heard it and I planted the seed and the Holy Spirit's going to do what he's going to do. But I want to dig and probe a little bit deeper into the soil of our hearts today. And I, I believe with all my heart that some of us are going to walk out of this room today freer. Yeah, I'm using your word, freer. Freer and lighter than you have in years. And all of the elders that are here in this room, I, I want you to just slip your hand up. If you're here, uh, you will be called upon by the end of this service. I'm going to need you to pray, so don't, don't run up and leave. Don't, you go to, if you've got to go to the bathroom, go to the bathroom right now. <laughs> but if you have your Bibles, I want you, to turn to, um, I want you to turn to Luke chapter 23, verse 34. If you don't have it, it's up on the big screen. This is Jesus talking. And Jesus, this is, now mind you, this is early in the crucifixion process. He was already on the cross. He was up on, he had nails in his hands and his feet, and they had already beaten him and mocked him, and they had beat him up pretty bad, and he says this out of his mouth, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. 
quick to forgive. He didn't wait until he was at the very end. He was in the midst of the crisis. He was in the midst of the offense. He was in the midst of the event of offense. And he says, Father, forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. Jesus is an incredible example right here, right now, to show us that what was happening to him was not affecting what was going on on the inside of him. And this is a great example to remind ourselves that when the offense comes, when the persecution begins, Father, forgive them. They don't realize what they're doing. I just said to my wife earlier, there are some people that walk around so extravagant and they flaunt around and they, uh, you know, hey, look at me. You know what that says to me? God, they need help. They flaunt their clothes. They flaunt their money. They flaunt their stuff, right, or their attitude. You know what that says to me? That's not a humble approach to life. They need prayer. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. But here's what I want you guys to see. He was a prime example of here uh, of not allowing what was happening to him to take root in him. In fact, we see him say this early in the crucifixion process operating in quick forgiveness. Say this with me. Love forgives quickly. This is how we're supposed to walk. This is how we're going to survive in this crazy, emotionally charged environment right now. And here's what's going to happen, guys. You've got to have a revelation of the, of the love of God and what he's done for you. He's reached for you. Come on, all of those of you who have been rescued by Jesus, just lift your hand. With that same hand, you're supposed to do this now. Hey, you saved me. You know why? Paul prayed it. Oh, may the eyes of your understanding be open. May you have a revelation of what Christ has done in and for you so that you would go and therefore do it to others. Well, I'm not giving them grace. Don't they know that if I forgive them, I'm approving of their sin? No, you're not. I'm not saying that you just because you forgive someone that what they did to you was right or wrong. Listen. What they did to you was probably wrong. But you still forgive them. What you're saying in the forgiveness, the act of forgiveness, is I trust God's word more than I trust what they did to me. And God will do unto them what I can't do unto them. Did he not say that judgment comes from me? Revenge is mine? Don't you get involved in that quagmire? That'll mess you up. How many of you guys have ever studied history? You guys, I love to watch history movies. I, I love to watch the History Channel. I love to hear about what has what, what is transpired even in our young country. I want to tell you the story today about President James A. Garfield. Anybody ever go to Garfield High School? Anybody here? You went to Garfield High School? Good for you. Did you know that your school was named after James A. Garfield? Wow, how about that? James A. Garfield... Was, uh, was one of our presidents, and honestly, I didn't write it down. I can't remember what number he was. Anybody remember what number he was? No, I don't. Anyway, um, on July 2nd of 1881, President James A. Garfield was shot as he was preparing to go on uh, vacation with his family. He was shot on July 2nd, preparing to leave for family vacation by some loony lawyer who came out and said, I want my way, or, you know, and you're not going the way that I want, so I'm going to pow. He shot it. He, actually, his first shot grazed his arm, and his second shot went in his abdomen and lodged somewhere in his, in his body cavity. Okay? So immediately, they take, there were some doctors around, immediately they take the, the president to a safe place, and with their dirty hands, say dirty hands, They begin to probe the wound because they had not yet studied about germs. They had not, in 1800s, they were still still not using gloves and, and cleaning their hands and they weren't, you know what I'm saying? With their dirty hands, they begin to probe the wound because the top priority to surgeons at that point for gunshot victims was we got to get the ball out. 
we got to get the bullet out. If we don't get the bullet out, it could cause lead poisoning or it could cause um, paralysis or it could even damage some of the organs. And, and history says that if they would have just left well enough alone, if they would have just left the, the, the bullet in him, he probably would have survived. In fact, the, the one who murdered him goes on to say after he died, well, it was the doctors that killed him. And there was some truth to that because what started out as a two-inch incision or a two-inch wound grew to over a 21-inch gash from his abdomen down to his, to his waist where they were looking for the bullet. This practice of trying to find the bullet actually led to him dying of sepsis. Where all of his organs started to shut down due to the infection from their dirty hands. And just like the doctors that probed the wound for the bullet, too many people keep probing the small wound of offense. Making it bigger, making it worse. So that something that could have been pulled up and dealt with, if just left alone, it could have healed itself becomes this incision that affects the whole body. I want to challenge you and, and, and give you this to think about this morning. Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Now let's get on with dying for the all of humanity. I got a job to do. You got a job to do. You've got something to do. And you don't have time to be messing with offense. You don't have time to be dealing with unforgiveness. You do not have the energy, the resources. You don't have the mind space to be dealing with that. God has something greater for you to do. And it has nothing to do with unforgiveness and offense. And so I would like to propose to you that you need to just deal with it once. And then leave it alone in your thought life. This is why being quick to forgive is the greatest first step that the Lord shows us. In other words, you don't purposely bring it back up in your thought patterns even when the devil does, right? How many of you know you get offended and then you see this person out in the grocery store, you see them on Facebook and you're like, I'm going to give them a piece of my mind. And the Lord is saying, no, just give them love. Why don't you bless them? In other words, when the devil tries to bring these thoughts up, you turn it away by reminding him quickly, I've already forgiven them. How many of you guys have ever um, hid when Jehovah's Witnesses have showed up on your doorstep? (laughs) Come on, be honest with me. I've done it. Salespeople show up on the front door and you're like, dear God. There are sometimes I just invite them in and go, let's just pray in the Holy Ghost right now. No, I don't do that. I'd like to. Come on, let's just pray in the Holy Ghost. How many of you guys have ever just avoided answering the door? It's that simple. When the devil tries to bring up the offense again, when he tries to say, look, you're offended. You should be ticked off. Don't you remember what they did? Don't you remember how many things you said they said about you? You need to get fired up. And he begins to stir the pot. I'm a firm believer that those people who stir, even the devil, those people who stir the pot should lick the spoon. You don't have to answer the door every time he comes knocking. I don't answer the door any time the Jehovah's Witness or salespeople come up to the door. If it ain't Amazon, leave it on the step. I'll get it later. You don't have to say, I don't have to answer the door. Come on, say, I don't have to open that door. Every time the devil reminds me of it. This is step one, be quick to forgive. Don't touch it again. You can probe around in it if you want, and you'll infect it and it'll get worse. We looked at this scripture passage last week, but I want to look at it again in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. This is Paul's divine supernatural revelation of the supernatural love of God. This whole chapter is how he loves us and how we are in turn supposed to love others. 
And in verse 4, he starts off and he says, love endures long. Long. Say long. It's not just, well, I did it once. No, long. you got to keep doing This is practice. How do your biceps get bigger, Arnold? By practicing, right? This is love. Love endures long and is patient and is kind. Love never is envious or boils over with jealousy. It's not boastful or vainglorious. It does not display itself haughtily. It is not conceited, arrogant, and inflated with pride. Pause right there. Sometimes you are right. Hmm? You know you're right. And everybody else knows you're right. You don't have to prove that you're right. Let it prove out. Let it just prove out. You don't have to prove yourself. You don't have to be arrogant about being right. I made the mistake one time saying, look, you're right. We were in an argument early on. I go, finally, she's right. You know, just as husbands and wives just tease back and forth. She, and I just knew immediately when she looked at me, she's like, you're sleeping on the couch tonight. <laughs> You can be right, or you can be happy. Take your pick. Verse 5, it's not conceited, arrogant, or inflated with pride. It's not rude. Unmannerly does not act unbecomingly. Love, God's love in us. That's the revelation of God's love in us. Does not insist on its own rights or its own way, for it is not self-seeking. It is not touchy or fretful or resentful. I want you guys to read this last part with me. You ready? Next, next slide. Ready? Let's read it out loud. It takes no account of the evil done to it. It pays no attention to a suffered wrong. Don't touch it again. Don't touch it. Okay, you've acknowledged it. And, and Jesus showed us what we were supposed to do in, in Matthew chapter 5. Didn't he? Pray, bless, do good. Pray, bless, and do good. This should be your mantra. Play, pray, bless, and do good. Pay no attention to the suffered wrong. This is not easy. But when you begin to realize what he did for us, you realize that wasn't easy, yet he did it anyway. Because he loved us. We've got to have a bigger perspective. It's not a human perspective. And as children of God, we don't have our perspective. Dead people don't have the right to have their own perspective. We have his perspective. I've been crucified. Isn't that what Paul said? I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ who lives in me. If Christ can love them even while he's hanging on the cross, don't hold this against them, Father. They don't realize what they're doing. Shouldn't we do the same? I know it's hard, but we're going to look at this uh, today. We're going to take some hard steps. Love ignores the wrong. It's quick to forget. You cannot have more than one priority. Pastor Tony just wrote an incredible blog on you cannot have more than one priority. If you have not seen it, go and check it out. But you cannot have one, more than one priority. I know these people all around the uh, TV right now are saying, you just need to multitask. You can multitask. You know why, that you, you know why it's against the law to text and drive? Because you can't do two things at once. Do you know why they put those cable barriers on Route 82? Because people were dying going over the left of center while they were texting and distracted while they were supposed to be prioritizing their focus on driving. You cannot think of two things at once. Let's practice it right now. I want you to just begin to count to 100 under your, under your voice. Just begin to count. Now I want you to say the ABCs while you're counting. A, B, C, D, E, F, C, G, H, I, J, K. You can't do two things at once. You can't focus on two things at the same time. And, and you cannot hate someone that is doing you wrong if you are actively blessing them, praying for them, and doing good for them. You can't do it. It's impossible. It may take you some actively, it will take you actively doing something to bless them to avoid getting into hate and, and cursing them. But that's what we're supposed to do, isn't it? Look, don't tell me that you're a Christian if I can't see it. 
I'd rather see it before you tell me that you are a Christian. We should be seeing it long before we're hearing it. It's going to take you some strong self-talk, even when the devil comes, to remind you of the offense. Let me just tell you again. Devil, that person don't live here no more. You don't have to. You know what unforgiveness does? It just gives that person free rent up here in your brain. Devil, they don't live here anymore. I freed them. I account, that's, that's, that, that account has been settled. And furthermore, because Jesus settled that with me, he gave me his grace. I just freely gave them grace. I want you guys to take a look at Luke chapter 17. If you don't have your Bibles, it's on the screen. But I just love to hear the, the rustling of papers. It's always a wonderful th- sound. In Luke chapter 17, we're going to start in verse 3. And then we're going to get into the meat of it. Pay attention, Jesus says, and always be on your guard looking out for one another. If your brother sins or misses the mark, solemnly tell him and uh, tell him tell him so and reprove him, and if he repents or feels sorry for having sinned, forgive him. You know, I think that we've negated, we've just not even paid attention to this. People get offended and they do something stupid and and Jesus says, "Look, if you're offended, tell somebody you're offended. Go to them and tell them." You don't need to broadcast it on Facebook. No, you don't. Nobody wants to see your dirty laundry. Just go to that person and say, man, that really hurt. Help me understand why you did what you did. That's what Jesus said. Reprove them. Tell them, like, hey, that didn't make sense. I don't understand why you did that. I need to understand because that wasn't what I was, that wasn't the revelation of our relationship, right? And then he goes on to verse 4, he says, And even if he sins against you seven times in a day and turns to you seven times and says, I repent, I'm so sorry, you must forgive him. Give up resentment, he goes on to say, and consider the offense as a recalled offense and annulled. Quick to forgive. The apostles then say to the Lord, Lord, increase our faith, that trust and confidence that spring from our belief in God. And here's what the Lord says. And the Lord answered and said, if you have faith, trust, or confidence in God, even so small like a grain of mustard seed, you could say to this sycamine tree, be pulled up by the roots and be planted in the sea, and it would obey you. In other words, he was saying, look, guys, your faith has a greater purpose. Your faith has has a greater purpose when it comes to forgiveness. This is the way of heaven. Just do it. Just do it. I want you to say like Nike, just do it. Mm -hmm. It's getting awfully quiet in this Baptist church. As Pastor Allen would say, thank you for your enthusiasm. I know that this is not an easy one to digest, but it's necessary if we're going to survive. I want you to notice, did you notice in in, in verse chapter 5, I'm sorry, verse 6, Jesus refers to the sycamine tree. Did you ever wonder why he didn't refer to the oak tree, why he didn't refer to the the, uh, cherry tree, why he didn't use a maple tree? He says this, speaking specifically to this sycamine tree. When you understand everything that's connected to the sycamine tree, you'll understand why he used it and not another tree. And I want to just take a couple moments to illustrate why he used this specific tree. In, in, in that verse, Jesus tells his disciples, if you had the faith, if you had faith as a grain of mustard seed, you might say to this sycamine tree, be plucked up by the root, and it would be planted in the tree and it should obey you. Keep in mind, he was speaking of unforgiveness and bitterness and that root that needed to be dealt with. And in verse 3, he tells the disciples that they needed to forgive those who've sinned against them. And at times, up to 70 times, 7. And it's, it, 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 it catches them off guard and they think that it's preposterous, right? And that's when they're like, okay, God, Lord, increase our, our understanding or increase our faith. Forgiving once is already a challenge, right? How many of you ever had to forgive somebody? You've done it once, then they do it again, and you're like, that's it. I ain't gonna, I, I gave you grace once. 
but I'm not going to give it to you again. He's talking about repeat offenders. He's talking about addicts. He's talking about people who struggle with the ability to control themselves and they do it again. They do it again and they offend you and they hurt you and they, they tick you off and all of a sudden you're in this place where you've got to offer love and grace once again. And you've got a choice to make here. Forgiving once is already a challenge for most people, but to forgive someone seven times in one day? Lord, increase my faith, they said. Lord, increase my faith. This statement was the equivalent of their saying, Lord, we don't know if we have enough faith to forgive that many times. You'll have to increase our faith if we're going to do this seven times. That's when Jesus began to teach his disciples this. You have to speak to these things called bitterness and unforgiveness and be intentional. If you really want these roots out, you've got to be intentional about uprooting them and not allowing them to stick in the soils of your heart. And if you really want to be free, he goes on to say, look, bitterness and unforgiveness are just like the sycamine tree. And if you really want to be free of these attitudes, you can intentionally take action and speak to these menacing things that are growing in your life and command them to get out. That's called self-talk. That's called intentionality. In other words, he was telling them, look, you don't need a lot of faith to uproot these things. Life and death are in the power of the tongue. You now have to choose wisely what you're going to probe, and what you're going to leave well enough alone. Was there a particular reason why he didn't use an oak tree or an apple tree? Watch this. Here are some reasons why he chose to use the sycamine tree. Number one. The sycamine tree had a very large and deep root structure. It was known to have one of the deepest root structures of all the trees in the Middle East because, of its, because its roots went so down, down so deep into the earth, it was very difficult for this tree to kill. Bitterness and, and, and unforgiveness, if they take root in your heart, they are very difficult to get rid of. Remember the trees of my neighbor last week? We talked about those. What a mess those make when you want to start removing big trees. It's easy to pull up a sapling. It's not so easy to take down 75-foot trees and then dispose of them. They leave a mess. Hot weather and blistering temperatures had little effect on the sycamine tree because it was tapped in to a very low water source deep in the earth. Even cutting into its base would not guarantee the death of this tree. No wonder Jesus used this as an example. Like the sycamine tree, guys, bitterness and unforgiveness, if not dealt with, they will dig deep into the root of your heart. Or they'll keep, and if you don't deal with them, they'll keep springing up. The roots of bitterness and unforgiveness go deep into the human soul. And fed by any offense that lies hidden in the soil of the heart, that hidden source of offense will, ca offense will cause these evil forces to resurface in a person's life over and over and over again. You've got to deal with it at the root. And so you can also see the negative effects of probing a once forgotten offense causing it to fester. Right? That's forgotten. Well, then I dig it back up again. Number two, the sycamine's tree, the tree's wood was, was, this is crazy. It was the preferred wood for building caskets in the Middle East. Why? Because it was so prevalent. He couldn't kill this tree. It was everywhere. Right? The sycamine tree was prevalent. Uh, it grew best where little rain fell and water was sparse. I want you to see the, the comparison here. Isn't this just like bitterness and unforgiveness? These negative attitudes flourish where spiritually dry conditions exist. You can almost count on finding bitterness and unforgiveness growing and blossoming. Watch this. Where there is no repentance, where there is no joy, where there is no fresh rain of the presence of the Holy Spirit. I'm not going to allow that in. I just won't go to church because every time I go to church, the Holy Spirit convicts me. That's the love of the Father. I've said this before. Do you know why they put guardrails along the side of cliff, cliff roads? Do you know why? Why? Because they look good? No, because they don't want you to go over the cliff. Sure, you may have to go and get some body work done if you rub up against one of those, but at least you ain't dead. That's the conviction of the Holy Spirit. 
When you get into the presence of the Lord and, and things begin to happen, things that Pastor Allen is saying, that Pastor Tony is saying that are going off on the inside of you, you need to change that. I, need, I loved you so much that I gave you an opportunity to change that. And you're like, I'm not going to church no more. They just convict me every time I go there. You've just rubbed up against the love of the Father, my friend. Better to get a little bit of pride knocked off than to die a spiritual death. What a powerful message this is. It tells us that bitterness and unforgiveness are deadly. Deadly. Harboring bitterness and spiritual, and it will, it'll spiritually bury you more quickly than anything else. These attitudes are the materials that Satan will use every time to put you six feet under. George Moss, our friend, used to say it to me like this. Michael, nothing will kill you quicker than a bullet than bitterness and unforgiveness. Does he not say that all the time? Because he knew that if you don't deal with the root, the sapling, it will go down deep. And you think you left it alone until the devil brings it up. You know what? And you keep answering that door. You keep opening that door. Oh, you keep opening it. Come on in. Let's have, a, let's have some tea and crumpets. Let's talk about it. And you keep playing that movie over and over and over in your mind. And you know what it's doing? It's the dirty hands of the devil getting into the wound that happened years ago. And he's probing so deep that the infection of bitterness and unforgiveness is causing sepsis in your soul. And you don't want to come back and have fellowship with church people. Oh no, I ain't doing it no more. Nothing will kill you quicker than a bullet than allowing bitterness and unforgiveness to take root in your heart. I want to stress this point to you because it's so important. If you permit bitterness and unforgiveness to grow in your life, it will not be long until these attitudes have killed your joy, have stolen your peace, and have canceled out your spiritual life. If you don't like the fruit that's being produced in your life, you better check the root. What I start off saying, emotions, they're indicators. You start to see those indicators come up. You start to see those locators come up. Let them locate you. They're not supposed to lead you. Number three, the sycamine tree produced a fig that was very bitter to eat. The sycamine tree and the mulberry tree were very familiar in appearance. They even produced fruit that looked identical However, upon the fruit of the sycamine tree being eaten, the, the eater realized quickly this is a bitter and a pungent and a very hard to eat fruit because of the bitterness. Its fruit looked just as luscious and as delicious as the mulberry fig, but when a person tasted it, they found out the reality. Some will nibble on its bitterness for a while and then eventually digest what they've eaten. And after they have thought deeply on their offense, they return to the memory dinner table and they start re-eating again leftovers. Taking one little bite and then another. <laughs> How many did that at Thanksgiving? My gosh, those pies just kept calling my name. They were not bitter. And as they continue to think and meditate on their offense at the dinner table, you start to realize they internalize their bitter feelings toward those who've offended them. And in the end, their perpetual nibbling on the poisonous fruit makes them eventually bitter. In other words, you are what you eat. You don't have to answer that door every time that, that devil comes knocking. You don't have to open it up and, and begin to touch that in your thought life anymore. Stop probing. Leave that wound alone. Stop probing. Look at your neighbor and say, stop probing. He's talking to you. Number four, watch this. We'll wrap it up with this one. Did you know that the sycamine tree was only pollinated by the wasps that stung its fruit? It couldn't pollinate and reproduce on its own with other, with other sycamine trees. It had to be stung. The fruit had to be stung deeply into the heart of the fruit by a certain wasp. And it was interestingly enough, this tree was not naturally pollinated. Pretty much every tree out there is naturally pollinated. 
The pollination process was only initiated when this wasp would stick its stinger into the heart of the fruit. Thus, the tree and its fruit had to be stung in order to be reproduced. Think of how many times you've heard a bitter person say, I've been stung by that person once. I won't be stung again. How many times have you heard a person say, um, what they did to me hurt me so badly that I'll never let them get close enough to me to sting again. It's likely that the people who make these statements have been stung by a situation that the devil especially devised a, a plan to pollinate their hearts and souls with bitterness and unforgiveness. And when a person talks like this, you can know for sure that the wasp of bitterness got to them. That's when Jesus said that in order to rid this nuisance from one's life, a person must, not, must only have the, the faith the size of a grain of mustard seed. I thought this was interesting. The word grain is the Greek word for kokos. It describes a seed. You know how big a seed, a mustard seed is? It's tiny. It's, it's very tiny. It's one of the smallest seeds. It's described as a seed, a grain, a very small kernel. By using this word, Jesus was telling his disciples that a great amount of faith was not needed to deal with bitterness and unforgiveness. In fact, did you know that any person, say any person, any person who has the tiniest measure of faith can deal or practice walking in love when it comes to unforgiveness and bitterness. The Bible says that each of us have been given a measure of of faith. So if you've received Christ Jesus into your life, you've received a measure of faith. You have faith. You only need to utilize a little bit of it, and that's God, I'm going to trust you, and I'm going to walk according to your word, and I'm going to forgive them. Watch. You can practice walking in love doing these two things. These are where we're going to leave off today. Paul says it like this in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 5. He says, look, you need to take every thought captive. You need to cast down every high thought that exalts itself above the ways and the love of Christ. So every time the devil knocks on your door, number one, don't answer that door. And if he does happen to get in and those thoughts start to get uh, uh, stirred up, you take captive of those thoughts and cast them down by saying, I've already forgiven them. Come on. Somebody said to me, well, how do I take captive a thought? Do I put handcuffs on it? Yes, with your words. Faith comes by. How does faith be, how is faith released? By speaking. And so when you say, I've already forgiven them, faith comes again. Well, I heard myself say, I've already forgiven them, so I must forgive them. Watch this. Here's why I say that. Because you're going to have to deal with other people mentioning them. They'll bring up their names. You'll be in a conversation. All of a sudden, they'll be like, did you hear about so-and-so, the person who offended you? And immediately, in your heart, you're going, <laughs> want to tear their head off. You got to deal with it. But as soon as it comes, as soon as it comes, as soon as, say, as soon as it comes, be quick to forgive them. I've already forgiven them. I've already let them go. I've already shown them grace. I've already shown them mercy. And don't let that thought take another root. You're going to have to see them in the grocery store. You're going to have to hear of, of thoughts of the initial offense. You're going to see them on Facebook. Just keep scrolling. Just keep scrolling. Just keep scrolling. Let it go. Uh, and I just want to make this statement again because I said it earlier and I want to just reiterate this again. Just because you forgive them doesn't mean that what they did to you was right. Please hear me. I'm not justifying their bad behavior by you forgiving them. I am saying this, that it means that you agree with God's word more by loving them and forgiving them. You know the way to victory. Number two, choose not to answer that door. I've said it once. I've said it a hundred times this service. Don't answer the door. When those thoughts come, like, like we learned earlier, it, it pays no attention. It lets it go. Some of y'all need to go watch the Disney movie Frozen and just sing that song again. Let it go. Let it go. This is the way you, this is the way you survive, isn't it, Riley? Just sing it for me. Go ahead. Let it go. I'm teasing you. You choose to stay free from this with your words and with your actions. 
You have to choose. If we're going to survive in this angry, angry generation, in this angry situ, uh, se season of life right now, I don't think I've ever seen it in my entire life how angry and, and hot-blooded America is right now. It's, it's nuts. It's not the United States of America any longer. It's the divided states of America. And right now we need to, as the body of Christ, be doing everything we can to unite one another so that they would see us and they would know that we're his disciples. Amen. Watch. Matthew chapter 5, verse 43 and 45. We're going to end it with this. Jesus said, you've heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies. Watch this. Bless those who curse you. Do good to those who hate you. And pray for those who spitefully use and persecute you. So that you may be called sons of your Father in heaven. I don't know about you, but I want to be called a child of God. We just sang about that, and it just did my heart good. I don't need to beat you up and tell you you're doing it wrong, but I do have an obligation to remind you that we are to be called sons of da and daughters of God by the love that we show one another, especially, say especially, those who don't love us back. So what is your desire today? As Pastor Allen comes and plays... Softly, I want to ask you a couple questions as we bow our heads and close our eyes. Perhaps you're in here, perhaps you're watching today, and there have been some roots that have produced some bitter fruits. I know I've had to deal with them in my own life. Perhaps you're, you're still seeing the effects years later after an initial gunshot wound of bitterness. And it's paralyzing you spiritually. Do you genuinely wish to be free from the roots of bitterness, unforgiveness, and the offense that has festered in your soul? Are you ready to rip those destructive roots out, clear out of your heart, so that they won't be able to resurface in your heart again? Are you tired of those detrimental attitudes? Killing your joy, stealing your peace, nullifying your spiritual walk with the Lord. Guys, these will keep you bound. But Jesus said, I have come to set the captive free. I want to invite the elders to come. And I want you to stand here at the, at the altar. And I want you to face the congregation. If you're like me, I was writing this message and I preached myself right into this. I wish I'd have had the opportunity to do what I'm about to do with you years ago. Years ago. Jesus wants you free. Free to do what God has called you to do. Your faith has a greater purpose. And a greater need for your faith is for not, not for this stuff. Not for this stuff. Here's where we just rip it out. I've asked the elders to join me, baby. Come up here. I've asked the elders to come up here because we want to give you an opportunity. This is nothing to be um, embarrassed about. This is, look, I've had it. I, I've, I've struggled with it. And, and if you want to be free from it so that you can, look, I, I, want you, I want to be the first one at this altar every week. This is us being transparent. We deal with bitterness. We've got to deal with it too. But perhaps you've just been, it's grown to a place where now it's, I need somebody to join me in faith. I need somebody to pray with me. Pastor Allen's just going to play, and I want us to all bow our heads. I don't want anybody looking around. Those of you who are watching online, this is God saying, I choose you. I choose to pull that out of your heart. I choose, to, I choose to partner with you and watch you walk free of this so that you can accomplish everything that I've written in my book for you to accomplish. Will you allow me to pull it out? If that's you, I want you to just come and stand in front of one of our uh, couple, our, our elders. And, and look, I, this is not a counseling session. They're just going to immediately begin to pray with you. And I don't want, I, I, I don't, we don't need the details. We just need to, you need to deal with it. Let it deal with it and then don't touch it again. Come on, there's one, there's two. 
I want you to just deal with it today. Come on. Nobody's asking questions like, why are you going up? Nobody needs to know. That's between you and Jesus. Take a moment. Take this moment. Jesus. These are important moments where spiritual directions and grace is rewriting stories. Rewriting. Where you say bitterness, you have no place here. Unforgiveness, you're not allowed to live here any longer. No longer. Ashamed, no longer guilty. He calls you forgiven. He calls you forgiven. And so release that forgiveness to others so that he might hear your prayer, that he might release it to you. Mark chapter 11, verse 25 says it like this. And when you stand praying, not if you stand praying, when you stand praying, if you have ought or unforgiveness or bitterness against anyone, release them, go to them, forgive them, so that your Father in heaven might forgive you. Perhaps those persons are, are a text away. Can I just challenge you? Perhaps maybe before the day goes, the sun goes down tonight, you release a text to them that just says, I just want you to know that I bless you, I love you, and I'm praying for you. Period. You make the decision. Maybe they've passed away and now you have no opportunity to release them. Can I just challenge you right now? There's still the ability to release them by faith. Faith comes by hearing. Hearing comes by the word of God. But faith is released when you just say it out loud. And maybe you just need to say it. I feel like there's somebody watching online. You just need to release that person by your faith right now. It only takes a small amount of faith. And here's how it goes. Father, forgive them for they didn't know what they were doing. And I release them and I forgive them. Maybe there's some of you who are standing here in this room. You just need to release someone who's gone on already. Just release them. Release them. Forgive them. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Jesus, Jesus, come on, Jesus, there's just something, there's just something about that master, savior, Ooh, master, you're my savior. with every head bowed and every eye closed. I want to just say this one last thing before we close. Those of you who are watching online, those of you who are here in this room, and you've struggled with uh, unforgiveness, you've struggled with bitterness, and, and you've just, you've done it in, in private, you've done it in silence, and the devil has just eaten you and eaten your lunch. 
because you've chosen to keep it in the dark. You've chosen to keep it under the soil and you've allowed it to fester in your heart. Can I just challenge you? Bring it into the light. Bring it into the light. Forgive them. Talk to somebody else. Bring it to somebody that you feel confident and comfortable, not as a gossip session, but talk to somebody. Bring it into the light and allow the light of the love of God to shine on that. Those of you who are watching online, those of you who are here in this room, you've even dealt with this. I, I don't even know if I'm saved anymore. The Bible says this, that everyone who would call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Watch this. Those of you who are here in this room, I choose to be chosen. The voice of the Lord calls to you again right now. The, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Sozo rescued, set into a safe place. That's what happens when you lift your hand and say, I choose to be chosen. If you would choose to be chosen, I want you to stand all over this room. Those of you who are watching online, join us as we stand and we close this time together. Your acknowledgement of choosing to be chosen is you standing today and saying, I call on the name of the Lord. It doesn't take a ton of faith, guys and girls to deal with unforgiveness and, 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 and bitterness. Deal with it and don't touch it. Stop probing in that wound. Amen? Tell me you still love me. Sometimes those messages are hard to deal with, but you've got to deal with them. You've got to deal with them or they will cause spiritual cancer and they'll eat you alive. I want to speak life over you before we leave. We bless you in the mighty name of Jesus. Let the eyes of your understanding be open and flooded with the clarity of the light of the gospel that this message brings. There's victory in the love of God. There's victory in the love of God. This is heaven's way, and so this is our way. This is heaven's way, and so this is our way. For God so loved the world this much that even while we were still sinning, offending Him, He died for us and showed us His love. 70 times 7, even today. You can't do two things at once. I want you to leave this place and go text someone. Maybe you've been holding it against them. Just release them. Just be quick to release them. Just let them go. I forgive you. I bless you. I'm praying for you. And change the world with that action today in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. God bless you as you go. We'll see you in prayer tomorrow night.